Sigoli, Nario Liwas, Skanagoga, Skanago. Greetings, class. It said, greetings. What is the news? Are you with peace? I am with peace as I speak here in the Uguay Uwe or Oneida language. So it is such an honor here. Fall term two, 2021. You all have been phenomenal so far in introducing yourselves. It's been a pleasure to get, get to know each and every one of you. So Yao Wang Ko, I went through and put reposts on, put responses to your posts on Canvas. So thank you so much for taking the time to tell us where you're coming from. We have people from Canada, different parts of Vermont, from California, from all over what is called Turtle Island or North America here. So um, I appreciate you all reading the article talking about indigenous peoples, which I know that moniker or term can be um, sometimes uh, perhaps misleading or hard to say wh wh which indigenous groups are we talking about when we talk about indigenous peoples. Indeed, and, uh, and African people from a People from Africa are indeed indigenous peoples as well as well are people from here in the United States. You would have indigenous people in New Zealand, be considered the Maori people. Indigenous peoples in Australia, considered aboriginals, First Nations in Canada. Uh, but certainly one of the reasons I choose to intentionally use the word indigenous as opposed to Native American is because as indigenous peoples, we existed before this concept of America was deemed. So when this term was coined, I believe around um, the 11th century or so, give or take. But so indigenous peoples had existed for thousands of years leading up to that as well too. So that's one of the reasons why. Also the term Indian, I always find it to be misleading as people who come from India. What would you call a person who comes from India for many of my good colleagues and friends as well too. So all that to be said is talking about indigenous practices of restorative justice. So indeed, one, one practice I can think of is from one of my colleagues, Dr. Pamela Taylor. And she is an elder in the nation of Kenya in Africa. And she told me about this trip where she went with Barack Obama's grandmother to go back to the village where his father came from in Africa. And she was traveling with some other people. She was doing restorative justice work. And as she goes, when they get to, when they're in Kenya and they're, the people there are set up, they're set up in a circle in a, in a, like a talking circle. And as they go around Dr. Pamela Taylor, she tells me that each of the, that Obama's grandmother would greet each of them and say, welcome home, as she would as she would embrace them all and give them all hugs and move around the circle. So I know that story always gives me the chills and connects with me and talking about these roots of this indigenous practices, indigenous in Africa, indigenous here in Native America and in <laughs> Turtle Island, I should say, and how different religious groups have used it as well, too. But certainly, so as we bring out the eagle feather box here that my great uncle Leonard made as we're talking about this indigenous practice i just want to say uh entering into this talking circle yao wang ko thank you all very much thank you to the creator mother earth uh for the additional tribal lands we're on uh, i just appreciate you all very much and hearing your responses as well too i can hear the heartache anguish perhaps frustration with uh perhaps actions of our federal government towards indigenous peoples and i can say i as well feel the similar frustration and in the words of john trudell this famous leader for indigenous peoples. He said, we, the people need to take back the, the political powers. We need to take back these political institutions, we as the people. So when I think about how our government is formed off of the Haudenosaunee, who were once five warring tribes, the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, around modern day upstate New York and Canada, around a wide, wide ranging area, came together uh, and they buried their tree, their weapons under the great white fir tree of peace. And that they used these circles, restorative justice, really, but really talking circles that we still use to this day since 1142 in our longhouse in upstate New York and still to this day. So for those in Vermont, not too long, not too far from your neck of the woods over there in Onondaga, our fire keepers there for the Haudenosaunee. Um, but indeed, yeah, so I, I appreciate y'all so much. This is whenever I, I, uh, hear of the atrocities and have the hard things that have happened to indigenous peoples through law, I always try to, uh, to try to remind ourselves, like in the words of Grace Lee Boggs, an Asian American activist and leader saying, like, we are the leaders we've been waiting for. And that and this, this notion that we must be the leaders that, that we need. So as we're looking around, I do believe, as was mentioned before, I think it was Kendra who put an excellent point of but we can still use restorative processes within our current our current criminal justice systems, which I completely agree with. And yes, I think it's to get to a fully restorative spec on the spectrum of being like fully restorative versus perhaps like uh, punitive. I think Randall pointed it out this notion of justice is healing, how he had never really heard that concept talked about before as well too in a class. Um, 
but just just this notion that there are baby steps that can be take, taken with even putting a restorative lens or restorative questions on meetings that are already in place. An example I think of is, we'll talk about later in the semester too, is Chief Justice Robert Yazi on the Diné Nation, which is in modern day Arizona. But as a leader for the criminal justice system and as a leader in restorative justice, Chief Justice Robert Yazi literally changed the dynamic of the courtroom that was already in place, as opposed to having the benches and people lined up in rows behind them. They he from the, him sitting on the, the bench there as a judge, they had all the rest of the chair just moved in a circle so that everybody's voice would be heard, that people would be able to share their stories and witness each other and hear each other for their empathy. As my cousin Eddie Cornelius taught me when teaching me talking circles, she says, TJ, the greatest gift you give someone is the gift of empathy, to be able to see the world through someone else's eyes. And when you give them that gift, you change their life forever. So as we go here, just wanted to take a look at where we just came from in terms of our reading. So Yawanko, thank you and Oneida for taking a look here from our week one, seeing all your responses so far. I appreciate it in terms of going over these readings in the justice is in, as healing, indigenous ways, talking about residential schools and intergenerational legacy. There are over 360 Indian boarding schools in the United States, over 130 Indian residential schools in Canada. The first one was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1879. And this idea was to kill the Indian to save the man. And this intergenerational trauma, which is another article we'll lead, read later in the semester, which was one I wrote as well too, which talks about the impacts of intergenerational trauma and what that is like as people when you're dealing with these concepts of blood memories or dealing with a blood memory is this, this notion that you have this trauma inside of you that is passed down. For instance, I read about this in this research article about a young person who would continue to walk by this, this place on their reservation. Every time they walked by this place, they would for, they did not know why they would start bawling and start crying and wondering why they're why they were crying and this kept happening until eventually they asked one of the tribal leaders and they told them about it and then one of the tribal leaders said oh yeah that is where uh, a massacre towards our people occurred uh, another example of blood memories was talking about what blood memories are in class of being passed down to this drama this un, unresolved trauma and, and healing that needs to take place one of my colleagues in a class uh, when I was at Cal State Long Beach taking a, a, a course in American Indian Studies, one of my colleagues begins to burst out crying as well. And he says, it's true, it's true. He says, I, I feel these blood memories and I, I have other friends that do as well too and no one knows about it. So residential schools are tough. On every campus, in Indian boarding schools, they had cemeteries by design on campus. At Carlisle Indian School, they had a, they, there was 180 cemetery stones found plus 14 more tombstones for unknown children, children who are so mangled and they were no longer able to be identified. So far to date, there has been over 7,000 indigenous children whose bodies have been found at Indian boarding schools and Indian residential schools. And this is in October 30th of 2021. So it is, it is very tough. So we're talking about decolonizing the truth restoring more than justice to talking about how the how how the gen, uh, the genocide is really the healing that needs to happen like that is the trauma this intergenerational trauma which it defines genocide of being this forceful removal or forceful destruction of a people or a cultures and talking about how yes indeed that's as other people had point out in the class so I, I don't know how this could not be considered genocide talking about hearing the hard stuff and what that is able to do and one of the reasons why I was taught intergenerational trauma <laughs> why I was taught talking circles and restorative justice was because of intergenerational trauma. And my cousin Eddie teaching me through, through intergenerational trauma from the Indian boarding schools and how we can use talking circles, we can use restorative justice to hold space for one another, to talk about some really hard truths. We can talk about systemic truths and harms. We can talk about historical harms and truths, but be able to hold a space for that. And the, the container, the medium would be this talking circle. We also learned about the Dakota Death March, taught in a, a really poetic form, which is heartbreaking and sad, indigenous peoples and human rights, and also this concept of punishment versus healing, and really recognizing that, that, that notion of, of taking justice instead of being this vertical idea from the top down, but moving it horizontally, like Chief Justice Robert Yazi for the Diné or Navajo people, and really seeking to restore instead of seeking to punish. But there is accountability, there is follow-up that there needs to happen, but there is also seeing each other for our humanity and recognizing that we are more than the worst mistakes we've ever made and to hear each other for our stories.
So thanks for taking the time to watch the videos as well too. I know those can be hard watches, but also good watches. So thank you so much. As we take a, a flip over here to the next screen, I just wanted to share with you all some important legislation. As I know we're talking about, I know we're talking about restorative justice, but I think it is important as pointed out, I believe by Randall and others to recognize, well, it is good to have a baseline of, of perhaps Indian law, of American Indian law, indigenous law here. So here are some impactful policies, a federal policy towards indigenous peoples. We think about the doctrine of discovery, which was in 1493, this palpable bull put forth by the Pope saying that any lands that were not inhabited by Christian peoples would be deemed terra nullis, meaning void earth or empty earth. And I'll show you in a minute that was used in a 2005 Supreme Court case. And it was recognized the doctrine of discovery as a land claims for European and later uh, colonists to lay claim, lay, lay claims, <laughs> lay land claims. Also talking about the Indian Commerce Clause in the Constitution, which was written in 1787. And it was in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, recognizing that Native American nations, they would be interacted the same way the federal government would interact with them as they would with international entities and state governments. So in the Constitution, outlining this sovereignty, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was a formalization of extermination towards indigenous peoples, put forth in 1818 and moving forward under President Jackson, Andrew Jackson. And this Indian Removal Act was the this formalization of moving people on these long walks. You maybe, maybe you've heard of the Trail of Tears for the Cherokee people, but for many other indigenous nations that had made these long walks where they were relocated forcibly, forcibly. And there is documentation of the different soldiers who were who were armed to escort these people, that they were often they were given alcohol to be put in an, a more agreeable mindset to be able to shoot people. I heard of stories that when children were too big to be carried but too slow to walk, they just killed the children. And having seen pictures of these massive holes in the ground of these massive burial sites of just bodies stacked on top of each other, just treated like human cattle, treated like not even human. So this extermination era would go until 1910, where we would then go into a termination era to try to terminate the federal government's responsibility towards the United States, uh, by, uh, towards indigenous peoples by diminishing their responsibility by, by making these indigenous peoples now United States citizens by fully assimilating these peoples. That was the intention of termination. So you have the in Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. This is important as well too, because even between, like for instance, World War I, where my great-grandfather served in, uh, my great-grandfather, Anderson William Cornelius, who was a full Oneida person. So he served in World War I in 1917, 1918, went to go serve in France before he was a US citizen. I had many other relatives who served in the military. When I asked these people, uh, why would you want to serve, I feel like, in a military that has taken so much from you? And this answer is very much the reason why I continue to run for public service and have been a part of public service. They say, well, when you're a warrior, you're connected to the land. No matter who's in charge, your responsibility is to protect the land, to protect the people. That's, that's your responsibility for Turtle Island. So Indian Citizenship Act, Citizenship Act of 1924 gives Indigenous peoples United States citizenship for the first time. It is in 1956, the Indian Relocation Act, which takes indigenous peoples from reservations where there is advertisements by the Bureau of Indian Affairs that for indigenous peoples that we would take them to urban cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, other major cities. And the idea was they were, they were advertising these jobs and housing, but the idea was that for many indigenous people, they were, they were taken off their reservations and they were bust into other places of deep poverty within different major cities. There is one recording of a interview I've heard of a person saying when they were taken and relocated with their families, they were saying, well, wait a minute, this is just, this is what we just came from, um, this poverty that we just came from. So then we go to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was the, one of the first time that many indigenous people had the right to vote in our representative republic. Indian Self-Determination Act of 1975, which then went from our area, era of termination, which was 1910 to 1975, and say, okay, we are now in self-determination where each of these tribal nations have a right to make their own governments, their own laws, their own, uh, whether I've heard it said by mentors, good, bad, or ugly, to make their own tribal governments, to, make your, to have sovereignty. That was recognized by the federal government in 1975, really returning full circle back to that constitutional relationship outlined up next year, talking about the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978. So this is, even though our constitution recognizes this religious freedoms that people should have, it is in 1978 where American Indian people, indigenous peoples are first allowed to really fully be indigenous to have their traditional ways legally. 
1990 Native American Languages Act. And this is important because before this, it was illegal for indigenous peoples to speak our languages. So even me saying Sagoli, Nadio Lewis, greetings, what is the news, would have been illegal until 1990. So during my lifetime, like my, my grandmother used to sing to me in the bathtub, that used to be illegal. Or for all those indigenous students who were at boarding schools, when they'd be taken from their homes forcibly, if their parents resisted, they would arrest the parents, take the children anyways. The children would be put, at, if you were with someone, a relative or someone who spoke the same language, the, it was the intentional design of the Indian boarding schools to, to relocate those people to different places so they, they could not speak with people. They'd had to learn English, even though which you may have heard of the code talkers, the Navajo code talkers, or also known as the Diné people. They used the Navajo language or Diné language to save the United States during World War II. And also since World War I, we have had 33 different tribal nations which have acted as code talkers here for us as the United States, which have helped, helped us win wars as well. And for many of those people were sworn to secrecy and confidentiality. And that was information that was, uh, had certain security clearances until, until, uh, until many years later, it was uh, until some people had passed away or after the actions had already taken place where people were actually finally able to talk about, uh, talk about these actions of using the different indigenous languages to help save the United States in different armed conflicts. The Native American Graves and Repatriation Act of 1990 recognized that indigenous peoples need to be returned when, when found in burial sites or when found in construction to indigenous peoples of the respective, peop respective areas. United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. This put forth this idea that all countries had to recognize the treaty rights they had with their indigenous peoples or any original land claims indigenous peoples had, they had the rights to those. So in 2007, four countries objected. They did not approve of this, being New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the fourth, the United States. So in 2016, there is the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is not a full support of the, of the, of the UNDRIP, of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but it is a, a step towards recognizing Indigenous peoples. So here, this is 2005, the city of Sherrill, New York versus Oneida Indian Nation of New York. So this is recognizing under the doctrine of discovery, fee title to the land occupied by Indians when the colonists arrived became vested in the sovereign first the discovering European nation, and later the original states in the United States. 2005 Supreme Court case. Here we have an 1863, on top would be a governor's ballot. And this is from a Winona Daily Republican, an 1863. This is a, in Minnesota. This is a, a newspaper going around. So the top part is Republicans, a governor's ballot. And then on the bottom part here, you will see it's talking about the state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every redskin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the, the dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. So this is one of the first uses of redskin and one of the reasons why I choose not to use that word when I can and I'm grateful that Washington football team changed their name from this derogatory term. Also looking at Native American bounties in California. I know some of us are talking being here in California or have been here before but advertisements in the California in the 1860s, it was advertised, it was $5 per decapitated head of indigenous people in California, or 25 cents per scalp. And these scalps were of indigenous children, women, men. In the first and second year, California rolled out this program. The first year, they paid out a million dollars in the program. The second year, they paid out a million dollars in the program. So these were advertising for mountaineers and people to pay the bounties to, for civilians to kill indigenous people. This is a more recent event from August 17th of 2021. So this past year, this is where a Colorado governor voids an 1864 order to kill Native Americans. You can see here, Colorado Governor Jared Polis signs an ex executive order that rescinds proclamations from Colorado Territorial Governor John Evans in 1864. And again, talk about the Native American boarding schools where kill the Indian to save the man. Yeah, as of most recent dates, 7,310 bodies have been discovered. This picture here in the bottom is of Carlisle Indian School, which was again used as the archetype where my great grandfather attended and ran away. He ran away twice and uh, he never came back the second time. The second time he ran away, it was on an outing during the 4th of July. And when he ran away, the different school agents talked to them as well too, or that they, they reported that he'd been missing. Later, many months later, my great-grandfather Anderson William Cornelius writes letters back 
to the Indian agency, to the, to the Carlisle Indian School saying, uh, I bet you would like to know where I am as of this morning. Well, I'm doing just as fine as I have been, going along as well as I have been. Nothing else to say at this point. However, you all have some money of mine, which, and I would like to have that back before I go work in the fields. And this was all in, in 2016. These Carlisle boarding school records were made public record. So those are available for people to look up and learn about. And on the right here, this is a famous picture as well, too. So Navajo Indian Tom uh, Toslino, when he arrived at Carlisle Indian School on the left, and after he had attended the institution for three years, before and after photographs such as these were used by officials at Carlisle as evidence of their success in, quote, civilizing their Indian students. So you can see here, long hair, which was a connection to all living things as well, too, and still is to this day for many indigenous peoples. His regalia, those crosses are not Christian crosses, but they're regalia for his people as Diné people and his cloth, his, his whole regalia of his clothing and attire. Then you see on the right, purposefully meant to look lighter skinned with the lighting and the coloring, also having shorter hair, Western colonized clothes, this idea of to kill the Indian to save the man. So this idea of decolonization is really, I've heard it said to trying to use the master's tools to deconstruct the master's house, to try to like kind of take back and empower us as people. But certainly understanding intergenerational trauma, it's important to understand Native American boarding schools for instance, another story from my good grandfather was when he was in the schools, they were oftentimes ran by church officials or priests, uh, oftentimes Christian or Catholic, different denominations. So in this particular school, the priests there who were running Carlisle would have sex with the different Native American girls who attended the school because they didn't view them as humans. So they would oftentimes rape, have their way with these young girls. When these girls became pregnant, they would take the babies and they would burn these babies in fires while they were alive. And my good grandfather, talked about hearing the screams of babies being burned alive. And he talked about seeing the bones as well too. So very hard and painful to even talk about or reshare these stories, talking about blood memories and different things. Uh, but it is important to talk about it. One of my former students in one of my classes at Vermont Law School, he was like, uh, Professor Reed, uh, Dr. Reed, uh, I, I think it's really important that you talk about how horrible and how terrible the boarding schools were for people to understand because we're not taught about these things. And by not talking about the fullest injustice that happened at the schools, we are there, we are in we are in action doing it an injustice by not talking about how terrible it is, by watering it, watering it down or sugarcoating it, making it easier to handle. So no, it's very uncomfortable and it's really hard. So this is talking about the hard stuff and this is recognizing intergenerational trauma. And this is where I learned restorative justice was through boarding schools and how to deal with that trauma. As I'm I am what's considered a third generation survivor of Indian boarding schools. And it was oftentimes not the boarding school people, the people who went to the boarding schools who committed suicide, it was oftentimes their descendants who committed suicide with the past down trauma and not in these unresolved issues, never being able to talk about them. So I had this, one of my colleagues, again, Dr. Pamela Taylor, she, she told me, and again, this elder in Kenya, she says, when we heal ourselves, we heal our ancestors. And I find that deeply to be true as I, I'm able to heal myself and be with peace. Sk uh, go. I am with peace, as I would say in Oneida. But indeed, it has been a hard journey and a journey I'm still working on every day. Now talking about the sterilization of Native American women. So up through the 1970s, the federal government forced sterilization of Native American women without their knowledge. This included other of women of color as well, other women of color too. So in the 1970s, the Indian Health Service sterilized without consent at least 25% of Native American women between the ages of 15 to 44. So pretty sobering numbers there to think about. Uh, how oftentimes women would, an indigenous woman would go to the hospital for, uh, let's say, getting her tonsils removed or an appendix, appendix removed. Or so while they, were, while they were under, a doctor would do a forced sterilization, a hysterectomy on a woman, and they would not know about this until years later when they were trying to have a child. And then when they go to the doctors, they would say, oh, no, you've had a hysterectomy. You, can never, you cannot have a child. So sometimes I've heard of stories where women were forced to have them, where they were told that if they, if they didn't, that that their, them and their family members would lose benefits or that think something bad would happen to them. So oftentimes forced by coercion or lies or just done without people's rightful consent or when people are in an altered state to, to get consent. So again, a very painful uh, truth and reality as we talk about intergenerational trauma and healing from such. And also the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978. This is important to recognize that Native American children should go with Native American families either a person from their own direct family, a relative, someone from their own tribe. If not their own tribe, then it would go open up to other indigenous tribal nations. 
And the idea was, this came from a recommendation from the American Psychological Association, recognizing the importance for indigenous peoples to be raised up with indigenous families so they can be connected to their culture, as it could be very difficult to not be connected to our culture. One example I think of as well is Kyrie Irving, who is uh, Lakota Sioux name is Gila, which means little mountain. And his mother was of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe and he, and he, she passed away when he was, I think, four years old. So he never really got to know his mother. So it's been through years later about learning about his tribe and his identity and how he's now been, uh, he's been formally, uh, he's been granted citizenship into the, the Standing Rock Sioux uh, member. And he's, he was, and he is, has a Standing Rock name. He has a, a Lakota name now as well, too. When I say this, the Dakota, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota make up what are considered the Ogala Sioux people. So it can be difficult not knowing our heritage, but it is that is an, an intentional impact of colonization. And when we think about issues, as I've been told, it's this idea that indigenous issues such as mental health and depression, suicide, alcoholism, that these issues are not innately indigenous issues that people are, are born with just because you're indigenous. These are issues that were caused by colonization, that are caused by disruption, historical trauma as well too. So when we're talking about restorative justice in indigenous communities, it is addressing the first harm that is the genocide towards, indig towards indig indigenous peoples. And again, as we learn this information is what, what do we do with this information? How do we move forward with this information? As it can be a lot to carry, but I, when I think about this, we acknowledge, educate and honor those people. And we try to move forward as a, a more equitable and just society and saying, how do people want to be treated now as is a, a country that does not know its past has no future. And if we do not, and if a country that does not know its mistakes are doomed to, re to repeat those mistakes in the future. So I think it's important to learn from these, learn from these mistakes, learn from these actions and seeing parallel actions as well too, as we see children in cages on the border and seeing what is not just the impact now, what is gonna be the impact intergenerationally for generations to come. So I say that to you all with a, an, an open heart, just saying I appreciate and am grateful for each and every one of you as we help try to create a more just and equitable society as we put our minds together. In the Oneida opening prayer, we have this refrain, we have this opening statement we say over and over. We say, let's put our minds together, so be it in our minds. And I, when I was doing my dissertation with one of my co-collaborators, he talked about this notion that that when we put our minds together, there's very little that we cannot accomplish when, when, all, when all of us put our minds together. So as we're doing this work, as we, again, the American Sign Language word for understand is like a light bulb going off in your head. And for the American Indian Plains language for sign language, is this notion from out from your heart, up and out from your heart to understand people. So as we enter into this indigenous practice, which has roots in Africa and here in North America, Turtle Island and with other religions, we look to seek to understand from our heart in our heart space, and also when, if we were to do a smudging, right? When you're using sage, which to, to burn sage to have this spiritual layer of protection and also has been known to kill off bacteria as well. I've heard people, when you smudge your hands, do good things. You smudge your head to think good thoughts. And I've also heard of people smudging to connect your head space and your heart space as that 18 inch journey is the longest journey we will take as human beings. Uh, I learned that from Don Coyhis, who is a, a restorative justice and talking circles facilitator and leader. So. All that to be said, let's take a look at what we're doing for this upcoming week. And again, I appreciate each and every one of you for being here. Yao Wang Ko. So for week two, make sure to do these readings from the same book as before, Justice is Healing, Indigenous Ways. Looking at these five different, uh, these five different book chapters right here. So look to get those gems of wisdom. You can have these videos as well. So this video you're watching, plus a, a few more after that. You can see which ones they are here. So talking more about this from a restorative justice, really the roots of it in indigenous peoples and practices. So the great laws talking about Haudenosaunee people and how we use this practice, Hiawatha and the great law of peace, a government for the people part two is talking about the indigenous roots of restorative justice and talking circles. And then how the Haudenosaunee's form of governance is what the United States is based off of as well. And it's talking about what is restorative justice. So, those are gonna be those videos to watch. Put your responses, looking forward to those responses, looking forward to learn from each and every one of you, Yao Wang Ko. And as we close out our time here, I know we, I'm a, I'm a big book guy and I believe it was Emma who said they were a visual learner as well too. So as we go into this space, a couple of books I wanted to share here. So we talked about one already called Paying the Land on week one, which has this notion about paying the land just like we would a relative or a friend. 
when we're going out there and paying our, our respects to the land for each of our, each week we're doing our 10 minute exercise of reflecting in nature or as with water, recognizing our relation to all living things or interconnectedness as well too, that, that we as human beings all live under the same stars. And if the earth is not your mother, are you from Mars? That is from Prolific the Rapper. But paying the land right here. Also we have, uh, if you're a graphic novel fan, Moonshots. So these are the indigenous comics collection, which are really powerful stories of indigenous peoples. There are three volumes of them and they are phenomenal. So volumes one, two, and the volume three, really great about indigenous futurism. So indigenous peoples in the future as well too. Just getting an idea of indigenous peoples and storytelling. As I'm told, we are all storytelling animals. How we get to know, we, how we get to understand the world. This book as well too, I Am Not a Number is the English translation, but this one looking at an in-depth look at Indian residential schools, just very sad and heavy, but an important look to understand and honor those peoples and the history they lived through to be resilient, that to still after facing all of that, the forcible destruction of a culture and peoples that we are still here today. And I'd still be able to talk to you and in my indigenous culture and uh, be able to tell you about these things. This book as well, Trickster, it's a winner here as well too. So you may have heard about tricksters and different indigenous Native American cultures. And this idea for tricksters are people that their characters, oftentimes rabbits, owls, coyotes, different animals for different tribal nations or groups, depending on where they were on Turtle Island, and sometimes commonalities, sometimes a coyote is a commonality. But these sacred, these animals will point out what is sacred by oftentimes being a trickster, by pointing out the irreverency, by um, so that, that this is a good book as well, too, if you're, if you're curious at all about that at all. And it's done through a lot of different stories in different art styles as well, too. So really cool just hearing different tribal nations and their, and their depiction of what, it, what a trickster is. Redbone, a great band as well there, too. For anyone who's ever heard of the show Reservation Dogs, it's on Hulu, FX on Hulu. Great new show, executive producer Taika Waititi. But there's a, an episode there where they talk about Redbone. Um, for anyone who, ever, who has ever seen the movie Guardians of the Galaxy, when you see Star-Lord, Chris Pratt, he's dancing in the opening scene to come and get your love. That's a Redbone song. And this book right here is really good, not only about the band, but also it talks really in, in depth about the Indian boarding schools, about different, uh, the American Indian movement, uh, about different atrocities which have happened to people, indigenous peoples as well too. So uh, really powerful book, really heavy themes, talks about the occupation of Alcatraz from 19... I believe that's 1969 to 1971, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'll have to double check my dates. It might be 1971 to 1981. Um, but yes, a lot, a lot of good points in here to check out. So do check out Redbone if you're interested. Also, 500 Years of Resistance, the comic book, another great one as well, too, looking at a bunch of points of indigenous resistance, of not just of, of, being, of having history happen to them, but also of being agents of history. The Mighty Code Talkers, talking about different tribal nations. This one specifically for the Navajo Code Talkers, but again, 33 different tribal nations that were Code Talkers. So a good book for that. And a big one here is String Man. So I love this one. Looking at this, kind of done in an anime-like art style, but talking about this Haudenosaunee game of lacrosse, which the medicine game, which I appreciate a great deal. So with that to be said, Yawanko, I hope you all keep taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, as that is one interpretation of the, the medicine wheel, which is also the four major elements of earth, wind, water, and earth, fire, water, and air. And it also has the four directions as well, too, with the north, south, east, and west. Even this notion, those things, they may seem like they're very different from each other, but I've heard it said before that if you go west and you keep going west and you keep going west, you keep going west, west, you'll eventually get back to here to where we're at right now. So that we are here, we're simultaneously in all these different places at once, all the different directions in our spirits and our energy. So all that to be said, Yawan Ko, thank you in Oneida, Nugiwa, until next time. And uh, in the words of, of DJ Feli Fell, if ain't nobody loves you, Dr. Reed loves you. Gunalunkwa, I love you. Take care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And thanks for being here. Looking forward to your thoughts.